Good morning. This is the Father's Day service, and uh, I hope that you are anticipating uh, honoring your dad today, and we uh, want to do that. This is Harris Memorial Church's uh, Father's Day message and service, and we'll be putting this out for you. And we're talking about Father's Day. And uh, the scripture reading we've had today is from Exodus 20, 12 and Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Now, a little boy said, Father's Day is just like Mother's Day, only you don't spend as much on the gift. And I thought, what gift? I ain't got one. And then Mark Twain said, when I was a boy, of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much he had learned in seven years. Being a parent and a father is, is an interesting and a very trying experience. I, I remember when my first child was born, I mean, my whole concept of life just kind of pew, and uh, I'm a daddy. I'm responsible for a child, and, and I have to figure out how to be a daddy. Well, someone said parents spend the most the first part of their child's life urging him to talk and to walk. And then the rest of his childhood is telling him to sit down and be quiet. One father said to his teenage son, Do you mind if I use the car tonight? I'm taking your mother out to eat, and I would like to impress her. <laughs> One father said to his daughter, What's wrong, Judy? Usually you talk on the phone for hours, and this time you only talk for 30 minutes. How come? The daughter of Judy replied, Well, it was a wrong number. A letter from a college student to his parents read, Please send food packages. All they serve here is breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I can imagine that being realistic for a lot of kids. Another son wrote home to his dad, and he said, Dear Dad, Please let me hear from you more often, even if it's only five or ten. And uh, you can read between the lines on that one. So parenting and being a father is, is a tough and a, and a trying thing. And yet there are real blessings. We're here today to remember the Lord and honor our earthly fathers. And we need to do both. Uh, honor the Lord and honor our parents. Exodus 20, 12 from the Amplified Bible says, Regard, treat with honor, do obedience and courtesy, your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God gives you. In a world that we live in today, and uh, that worships and imitates youth and uses assisted suicide euthanasia to eliminate uh, the older people, this commandment sounds like a, an echo from a time warp. But the Jews were taught to respect age, to care for their senior citizens, a good example for us to follow in America. Someone has said that the elderly are the only outcast group that everybody expects to join because nobody wants the alternative. But how we treat them today will help to determine how we're treated tomorrow because we do reap what we sow. So let me start off with asking a question here. What, what does honor mean? Honor our parents. Good definition is to affirm a person's worth and value. To affirm a person's worth and value apart from their behavior. That simply means that's unconditional love like, like Christ's love for us. Romans 5, 8 tells us, but God shows and clearly proves his own love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, <laughs> died for us. Some synonyms for honor would be respect, admire, esteem, regard, reverence, devotion to. You see, an honoring heart loves his parents, loves his siblings enough that he will confess any, any unhealed offenses and seek forgiveness for those we have hurt. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Philippians 3, 12 through 14, from the Amplified, it says, Not that I have now attained this ideal or have already made perfect, but I press on to lay hold or to grasp and to make my own that for which Christ Jesus, the Messiah, has laid hold of me and made me his own. I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured and made it my own yet. But one thing I do know, it is my one aspiration, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the supreme and heavenly prize to which God in Christ Jesus is calling us forward, upward. We are unperfect imperfect dads and we had imperfect dads and we we're raising imperfect children and uh, in in family there's there's the struggles that we have and oftentimes there's there's some hard feelings or things that, that just kind of hang on to us uh, and we need to to learn to forgive those and you know to move on uh, we deal with our own faults before we uh, talk with somebody else about their faults. We first deal with our own. Ephesians 4.32, uh, a very good verse. It says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiven one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So we need to learn to forgive uh, our parents. We need to learn to forgive our siblings. We need to learn to forgive those in our family that uh, maybe we've heard or they heard us and we need to, to deal with those things and forgiveness is somewhat of a, a process of, of acknowledging uh, our responsibility in, in something that went wrong and, and feelings got hurt and when you when you try to deal with some of those things let me point out three things you need to try to to remember uh, if and, and be honest and, and humble uh, because we're imperfect and our parents are imperfect you're imperfect and uh, we live in a, in a messed up world. And uh, we all have a flesh to deal with. And we all make mistakes. And, you know, as a parent, uh, I recognize, uh, oh, look back and I can weep over some of the mistakes that, that I've made, the things I've said, and the things I've done wrong. But my heart has been right and I've, I've wanted to, to live and, and be the dad that my kids have wanted and needed. So when, when you're dealing with, with hurts and you're dealing with emotional baggage that maybe is left from uh, your childhood, uh, be honest, be humble, and compassionate. And the first thing is to be specific in naming uh, what the issue is and what, what hurt and how you got hurt or how you hurt someone else. And, and your part of it, admitting you're wrong and the wrong thing that you said or did uh, is much better than saying I'm sorry. Uh, when we just say I'm sorry we've not really come face to face with the things that we need to to really deal with and and admit and when we admit our wrong uh, we, we need to just admit it I was wrong that was not right and the third point is be specific, admit you're wrong, and don't justify it. I can justify all the times I blew it, and I can rationalize, and I can explain why why this happened. But you made a mistake, you admit you're wrong, and, and you don't try to rationalize it, you don't try to explain it away, uh, why you said this or why you did this. Uh, so be specific, admit you're wrong, don't justify, rationalize, or make explanation of why you offended your family member. 2 Corinthians uh, 1, 3-4, from the message, a paraphrase, says, All praise to the God and Father of our Master, Jesus the Messiah, Father of all mercy, God of all healing counsel. He comes alongside us when we go through hard times, and before you know it, He brings us along side someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be better for them, be there for them, uh, that person just as God was there for us. And, you know, uh, we, we've talked about many times that 
God blesses us. God, God brings healing to our life. God brings us through the valley. God brings us through the difficult times so that we can be a blessing to someone else. God uh, uses us that way. Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. And I think the bottom line when we're talking about honoring our parents here is uh, deal with things and, and don't let it build up. I, I know families that... Uh, Kids don't speak to their brothers or sisters because of something that happened. Sometimes the mom, the dad divorce. Uh, sometimes the the children don't speak to the dad, or or you know, just 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 distance and build walls. Uh, I think the bottom line, bottom line of honoring our parents is, is don't let any emotional baggage hinder you or hurt you in other relationships. Uh, you know, sometimes if we're hurt in, in a situation and, and we don't deal with it and, and ask for forgiveness and move on, then that may hinder us in our marriage and it may hinder us in parenting our children. So deal with the stuff and, and work out and get rid of the, the emotional baggage and uh, look for God's forgiveness. So, okay, we've been talking about honoring our parents. Now, let's focus a little bit on the things we often take for granted from our parents. And tell our dads, thank you. First of all, we need to thank our dad for material provisions. 1 Timothy 5 8 says, If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Wow, that's kind of strong words. If a father doesn't provide materially for his family, food, clothing, shelter, then he has denied the faith of Christ and is worse than unbelievers. That's, that's kind of strong words. And, you know, I, I think in, in the culture, I, I guess I grew up in the culture where uh, the dad was responsible for the family. And that culture today is, has changed somewhat. Uh, why would a father be worse than an unbeliever? Well, because most of the unbelievers provide for their families. And if we're a Christian and, and Christ is the Lord of our life, then we would... Uh, be be wise and foolish and unchristlike if we didn't provide for our families. Huh. My dad passed away back in 1972. If he was alive today, he'd be 111. He was a farmer, I guess, about all of his life. But to provide for his family, he took on a lot of extra jobs. My brother told me more about my dad than, than I experienced myself. In the early 50s, he uh, worked on the Marine Base, Camp Lejeune, as a carpenter. And uh, he would labor all day long, sun up to sundown. And then he would go home and work till midnight farming. And his mornings began with farm work at 4 o'clock. And then he headed to Camp Lejeune. In the mid-50s, I, I can remember he bought a combine and harvested corn and wheat a few years then late in the 50s, he built four chicken houses to help ends meet. He sold some of the land he labored hard to buy in order to provide for his family. I never rec recognized the sacrifices that Dad made for me. The old house we lived in wasn't much. It was in bad shape. and uh, But I can vaguely remember uh, it burned to the ground in the early 50s. And I can remember we lived in a pack house uh, of a neighbor. And I remember neighbors came and, and uh, they, they put up a block building. And, you know, it was a block building that, you know, all the walls, everything was blocked. And uh, it was, it was kind of a plain block building. And as time passed by, uh, Dad was able to get some doors and put up and, and uh, just add to and improve. Uh, facing boards and, and other things like that, and paint. But the last major home improvement was when we got an indoor outhouse. And that made everybody happy. You see, we didn't have a car back then when I was small. And if we went somewhere, we either walked or we got to ride on our John Deere tractor to the store, which is about a mile away. Well, I love my dad but I never recognized the sacrifices he made for me and for us until I became a dad and the responsibility that came with it. 
when Con and I got married, we moved to Nashville to prepare for ministry. Then we came to the children's home. Then we became pastor. And we recognized we needed a home, so we bought some land where we built our home at. Guess where the down payment came from? From the sale of land that Dad had sacrificed to purchase. Thank you, Dad. Now, what about your dad? Did he provide for you? <laughs> I bet he did. He probably did, and, and you need to thank him for it. And if he's still alive, and if not, you need to give thanks God to God that he gave you a dad that, that provided for you. Bo Boyce Moulton, a preacher in uh, Call Junction, Missouri, uh, near Joplin, he said these words by his grandfather, which I think are kind of appropriate. He said, my grandfather, R.C. Myers, came from, from Kentucky. He married a Kansas girl and settled down in Indian Territory, which later became the state of Oklahoma. Well, they had 16 children. It never occurred to my grandfather that the government should take care of his family. That was his responsibility. He was a law officer before there was even a state, but became a sharecropper in order to feed his family. Their poverty did not discourage him from the personal pride of caring for his own. He raised his children without the benefit of electricity or running water. He died without ever having a driver's license. His children, nevertheless, grew up to be hardworking, patriotic, and devout citizens. I am confident that in spite of his poverty, he did a better job of providing for his own than the government would have. Thank God. Thank God for all the fathers who provide for their children and for their families as the best they can. And the sacrifices that they've made that you never recognize, stop and think and, and thank you, God. A second thing we need to thank our fathers for is his faithful instructions. In Ephesians 6, 4, it says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Uh, contemporary English version says, Parents, don't be hard on your children. Raise them properly. Teach them and instruct them about the Lord. And the Living Bible says, Don't keep on scolding and nagging your children, making them angry and resentful. Rather, bring them up with the loving discipline the Lord himself approves. So fathers, do instruct your children. And I hope that you have instructed your children about a lot of different things. Someone wrote these words, and uh, I think you can probably identify with them, and you've probably said them, and you've heard your parents say them. Uh, things according to the world according to dad. Words that most dads have said at some time or another to their children. This is going to hurt you more than it hurts me. Or it's going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Quiet. I'm watching the ball game. Don't forget, check the oil. Bring back all the change. How should I know? Ask your mom. I'm not made of money. When I was your age, I walked five miles to and from school each day, and it was uphill both ways. You are going, and you will have fun. Who's paying the bills around here anyway? If you break your leg, don't come running to me. Don't put your feet on the furniture. Your mother will kill you. Hey, get down before you kill yourself. Oh, one second thought. Go ahead. Quit playing with your food. Be quiet. Can't you see I'm thinking? Why? Because I said so. If you don't quit that, I'm going to call your mom. You better get that junk picked up before your mama comes in here. Just wait till you have kids of your own, buddy. I wasn't asleep. I, I was just resting my eyes. And like many parents, I'm sure we've all said something like this. I don't care if everybody else is doing it or if everybody else is going, but you're not. Fathers have uh, given all kinds of instruction to their children about 
such things as school and work and relationship and dating and driving a car and uh, the joys of, of those times uh, you could write a book of each one of us could about if we had enough memory to tell about the experiences of raising our children and some of the funny things that happen uh, but again let me quote uh, Boyce Moulton said of his father after he passed away he said more memorable than my household responsibilities were the endless streams of corrections which came my way. My father never stopped correcting me. And just a short while before he died, he looked at me from his hospital bed and says, Why don't you get rid of that belly? Boyce went on to say, I gave reverence to my earthly father. I was afraid not to. He would have taken a belt to me if I dared to disobey. He tried to teach me anything that would help me in life. I was thumped on the back a thousand times and told to straighten up. He insisted that I make my, take my elbows off the table and stop eating like an animal. And he never hesitated to tell me to wash my face, comb my hair, brush my teeth, or shine my shoes. Sometimes he would say, you act like you fell out of a hickory nut tree on your head. Or worse, he would say, you'd have to go to summer school before they let you go into the insane asylum. Dad's <laughs> instructions. There's a man named Jim Burton said these words about being a father. He said, when I was young, baseball was my life. You can imagine the excitement I felt when my oldest son began playing. This game would be one of our main bonding mechanisms. If my son would just listen, I could help him be a great baseball player, learning to read curve balls, shift his weight, body weight with his swing, to steal bases and turn double plays. Oh, these things, they, they separate the amateurs from the pros. Burton went on and said, A pattern developed in our relationship. Because of my familiarity with the game, I saw every mistake my son made. In addition, I knew how to correct them. So, post-game drives home became a critique of how to improve his game. And it soon got old for my son. One night he finally said, Dad, could you not start by telling me everything I did wrong? Not start with telling me everything I did wrong. Tell me what I did right first. So easy as a dad to, or any parent to, to focus on the negative and forget to, to point out the positive. A faithful father's instruction is important, but we have to be careful how we deliver it. All criticism and no praise, that's not good. And that's what Paul was talking about in Ephesians 6, 4. Paul said, don't keep on scolding and nagging your children, making them angry and resentful. Dads, are you a, a coach or a critic? Do a little bit of thinking. Let me share this with you. Uh, a sad confession of one father. And uh, I, hope, I hope it doesn't identify any of you today, but if it does, may God step on you. One father said, I took my children to school, but not to church. I taught them to drink, but not the living water. I enrolled them in a little league, but not in Sunday school. I showed them how to fish, but not to be a fisher of men. I made the Lord's Day a holiday rather than a holy day. I taught them the church was full of hypocrites and made the greater hypocrites of them all and me. I gave them a color TV, but provided no Bible. I handed them the keys to the car, but did not give them the keys of the kingdom of God. I taught them how to make a living, but failed to bring them to Christ, who alone can make a life. You need to thank your father for the instructions he's given you, and he gave you the good advice, and especially if that included the Lord. And that brings us to the third thing. 
We need to give thanks to our dads for a godly demonstration. The dads, to be a godly example, we have to be godly. Paul told Timothy how to be a godly example. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul said to the Corinthians, who were his children in the faith, follow my examples, I follow the example of Christ. Notice there, Paul didn't say, do everything I do. He said, do everything I do which is Christ-like, or follow the example of Christ. Paul wasn't perfect, he knew he wasn't perfect, and, and neither are we. Uh, children, there's some things that I have done in life that I do not want my children to do. I'm sorry when I have given them a bad example, but I have also done some good things, and some good godly things, some Christ-like things, which I, I hope they will copy after me because I'm trying to copy Christ. But the most important thing is being a godly parent, a godly person, and loving people. One man said, when I was a teenager, Dad would come in my room and say, Come on, kid, let's go. Where to? Lucy's. Once a month, Dad would visit Lucy Butchko, a woman whose body was twisted and pinned into a wheelchair by arthritis. He would reach his big arms around her frail body. He'd lift her out of the wheelchair and place her in the front seat of our car, station, old station wagon. Then he would fold the wheelchair, throw it in the back, and drive Lucy to the monthly communion service for shut-ins. Now, Dad was a vice president of a publishing company who, who shuttled shut-ins. Later, while in the hospital trying to recover from a massive heart attack, my dad found out that a family down the street didn't have enough money to, to buy the groceries. So he wrote them a check. Well, that was the last thing he ever wrote. And it was a lasting lesson for me. What a father. What a father. And what a great demonstration of Christ he was to his son. Here's another story I think it illustrates it. One man said of his father, Once when I was a teenager, my father and I were standing in line to buy tickets for the circus. Finally, there was only one family between us and the ticket counter. This family made a big impression on me. There was eight children all probably under the age of 12. You could tell they didn't have a whole lot of money. Their clothes were not expensive, but they were clean. The children were well behaved, all of them standing in line, two by two, behind the parents, holding hands. They were excitedly jabbering about the clowns and the elephants and the other acts that they were going to see that night. And one could sense that they had never been to a circus before. It promised to be a highlight for their young lives. And the father and the mother were at the head of the pack, standing proud as could be. They were taking their kids to the circus. The mother was holding her husband's hand, looking up at him as if to say, You're my knight in shining armor. He was smiling and basking in pride, looking at her. Well, the ticket lady asked the father how many tickets he wanted. He proudly said, Please let me buy eight children's tickets and two adult tickets so I can take my family to the circus. The ticket lady quoted the price. The man's wife let go of his hand. Her head dropped, and the man's lips began to quiver. The father leaned a little closer and asked, How much did you say? The ticket lady again quoted the price. The man didn't have enough money. How was he supposed to turn and and tell his kids that he didn't have enough money to take them to the circus. Seeing what was going on, my dad put his hand in his pocket. He pulled out a $20 bill and kind of dropped it on the ground. And we were not wealthy by any means. My father reached down, picked up the bill, tapped the man on the shoulder and said, Oh, excuse me, sir. I believe this fell out of your pocket. Well, the man knew exactly what was going on. He wasn't begging for a handout, but certainly appreciated the help in a desperate, heartbreaking, embarrassing situation. He looked straight into my dad's eye, took my dad's hand in both of his, squeezed tightly on the $20 bill, and with quivering lips and a tear streaming down his cheek, replied, Thank you. Thank you. This really means a lot to me and my family. 
Wow, what a dad. What a dad. The man telling the story about his father said, my father and I, we went back to our car. We drove home. We didn't go to the circus that night, but man, we had a good time helping somebody else. What a father that man was. What a godly demonstration of Christ. And I thank God for fathers who have been godly demonstrations, godly examples to follow. In conclusion, let me just challenge you to honor your dad. Thank him for the sacrifices he's made to provide your material blessings. A roof over your head, clothes for your back, food for your stomach, and a roof over your head. And the instructions he's given. And the example he's given. Let me close with a, a letter to dad. There are so many things I'd like to tell you face to face. I either lack the words or fail to find the time and place. But in this special letter, Dad, you'll find at least in part the feelings that the passing years have left within my heart. The memories of childhood days and all that you have done to make our home a happy place and growing up such fun. I still recall the walks we took, the games we often played, those confidential chats we had while resting in the shade. Dad, this letter comes to thank you and for needed words of praise, the counsel and the guidance, too, that shaped my grown-up days. No words of mine can tell you, Dad, the things I really feel. But you must know my love for you is lasting, warm, and real. You made my world a better place. And through the coming years, I'll keep these memories of you as cherished souvenirs. Let us pray. Father, we're so grateful that uh, you've given us opportunities as men to, to be fathers and be parents of our children. And Lord, we all fail and we all make mistakes. And Father, give us wisdom as we parent our children and our grandchildren. Lord, we need your wisdom as we talked about last week. And we need your guidance and your direction for us and our families. And we want you to, to help us to be the dads you want us to be. Help us to give the instructions we need to give. Help us to be the godly examples that we need to be. And Lord, thank you for giving us strength and health to be able to provide for our families. Be with us this day, and may we each honor our dad. In your name I pray, amen.